welcome to Rutgers and uh, uh, thanks to uh, Jiang Tao who put all this talk together. Our guest speaker today is Professor David uh, Mozina, uh, who received his BA in religion from Columbia University and also spent his junior year at King's College uh, of London University. He went on to earn his master's and also his PhD degrees from Harvard Divinity School. And uh, uh, he completed his dissertation in 2009 uh, under the guidance of professors uh, Michael, Michael Pewitt and Kimberly Patton and Paul Anderson of uh, University of Hawaii. Uh, his dissertation uh, is entitled Quelling the Divine, the Performance of a Talisman in contemporary thunder, thunder ritual. As the dissertation title suggests, Davis' research focuses on living Taoist and Buddhist ritual traditions in Hunan province in South Central China, and the roots of this tradition in the liturgical vibrancy from the Song, Yuan, and early Ming periods, roughly that is from about 10th century to about uh, 15th century and also in the religious traditions of late imperial period. So roughly, we're talking about late Ming to Qing, 16th century to the 19th century. He's particularly interested in uh, phenological and semiotic uh, approaches to ritual and in the relationship between ritual and material culture, such as, of course, uh, talisman, liturgical implements, as well as religious art. He's also particularly interested in the ways uh, combining historical with anthropographic, you know, uh, approach researches to study Taoism. His ongoing uh, research project, research work has so far resulted in the publication of his first monograph uh, entitled "No uh, Knotting the Banner: Ritual and Relation and Relationship in Taoist Practice." Uh, this just came out actually this year, so this is really freshly, very freshly sort of a big, and uh, it's a coming out of a Chinese University of Hong Kong Press and probably, uh, I think, distributed uh, online also through Columbia University, if I understand, and also. Uh, meanwhile, he also has published nearly half a dozen or so peer-reviewed articles and book chapters in academic venues such as Journal of Chinese Religion, Cahier um, de Extreme Nasier, as well as uh, the Journal Art of Chinese University Taoism, religion, history, and society. In addition, David has two other major monographic projects uh, in the pipeline. One is tentatively entitled The Rights of Fengdu, uh, which is a um, uh, phenom phenomenolo phenomenological and also historical study of the last several chapters uh, in a compendium of Taoist uh, rituals. This is known as the Gao Fa Hui Yan. The second monograph. Uh, project uh, that's also underway is uh, tentatively entitled as Death of a Taoist and the Roots of Modern Buddhist, uh, Buddha and Taoist Practice. And this actually has already been covered by a, uh, a Washington Post article as well. So um, without further ado, uh, let's uh, please join me in extending a warm welcome to uh, Professor uh, David Mozina to Rutgers. So David, it's your screen now, so. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna share uh, my screen with everyone. All right, can everyone see that? Are we all set? Yo, Shun, are we okay? Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so before I begin, I'd like to thank Professors Yo Shun and Jiang Tao for inviting me to speak at the Rutgers Center for Chinese Studies. I'd also like to thank the Rutgers Global China Office and Religion Department for co-sponsoring this event. Intellectual communities such as this are the lifeblood of the study of China, which is needed now more than ever. This talk draws on scholarship included in my new book, which Do Xun mentioned. Uh, I'd like to thank my friend and collaborator, photographer Doug Cantor, for permission to use his images, uh, which uh, the book cover is one. It will be obvious in this talk which photographs are his and which are mine. Okay. So I'd like to begin with a story, right? Please uh, calm your minds and do your best to imagine the following. Chen Diwen 
puffed on cigarettes, one after the other, as he sat on a stool on the front porch of the modest two-story brick and wood structure in which he lived with his grandparents and wife. The house was perched on the side of a verdant hill above the tiny hamlet of Mount Shashan, one of hundreds of poor hamlets dotting the rugged uh, Great Bear Mountains of Hunan province. He sat under the awning of the house, protected from the, deadly pour the steadily pouring rain. From time to time, he stepped out onto the dirt path to look up the hill, peering between the raindrops at a, at a bamboo flagpole that had been erected in a terraced rice paddy, and particularly at the dark blue cloth banner that billowed from it. It had been some time since he had finished performing the Taoist ritual in which he produced a long talisman written on a three by eight foot banner and then hoisted it onto the pole. He craned to see whether the wind had tangled into knots the five pennant-like streamers cut into the unattached end of the banner. He saw that it had not, and that the long tapered shapes of the streamers continued to flicker like flames in the healthy breeze, as they were when he first raised the banner. Chen returned to his stool on the porch and avoided eye contact with the dozens of masters, relatives, and villagers who were attending his ordination into the priesthood that day. Nervously, he continued smoking. The absence of knots and the penance meant that the deity he had summoned during the ritual had not yet heeded his call. Chun felt anxious for good reason. His ordination into the priesthood hinged on the deity's response. For the last four years, Chun had trained with local masters in the Taoist lineage that dominated the area. As an apprentice, Chun had assisted in the various rites officiated by them. Finally, after his masters had agreed he was ready to be ordained, Chun spent 49 straight days diligently memorizing and practicing the hour and 20 minute long summoning ritual, making sure he could properly inscribe on the banner the complex talisman the ritual was designed to produce. On that rainy day, Chun Di Wen performed the banner rite to summon Sire Ying or Ying Gong Fan Fa as the first ritual of his own ordination or Chuan Du Jiao. This performance was the first time he had ever officiated over a ritual in public. If he happened to be unsuccessful and the deity failed to descend from his celestial palace and use the wind to knot the summoning banner, the rest of the three-day ordination would likely be aborted. Chun's lineage recognizes a deity called Celestial Lord Yin Jiao, also known as Thunder General Yin Jiao or Prime Marshal Yin Jiao as the primary agent of their liturgical power. Technically speaking, it is not the masters themselves who drive away demons that cause illness, economic misfortune, and agricultural irregularity. It is a celestial, it is celestial lord Yin Jiao and a host of other heavenly generals, such as Wan Lingguan here, and their spirit armies, who, under the master's command during ritual, pacify, disperse, or sometimes even destroy disruptive demons. Yin Zhao and his forces safeguard individual households from any sort of calamity, often economic, and protect the bodies of its inhabitants, especially women who are susceptible to complications during pregnancy and childbirth, and children who are vulnerable to disease from demonic meddling. At times, Yin Zhao and his minions are, char are charged with healing a household or person who has already been afflicted. The banner rite is the ritual way masters in Chun Di Wen's lineage attempt to summon the powerful Yin Zhao and submit him to their will. A failed banner rite at ordination would signal for all to see that the ordinant, the apprentice seeking ordination, could not secure General Yin's allegiance and thus could not direct, direct the deity's exorcistic power to fulfill a ritual need. The young master's liturgical work would lack efficacy. No one in the community would spend their scant money to hire him to officiate over liturgies, exorcisms, or funerals. No wonder Chen waited so anxiously for the banner to knock. I begin with Chen's palpable anxiety that day. I ask why his performance of the banner rite felt so intense. On one hand, it's easy to see that the social conditions surrounding the banner rite generated much of Chen's concern. The community that would furnish his livelihood was watching in inescapably empirical terms whether he could muster enough divine power to merit hiring in the future. His performance of the Bannerite was a de facto job application for which he had been preparing for years. But today, I wish to get at Chen's anxiety from a different angle. 
I want to ask whether anything in the liturgical workings of the banner rite itself contributed to his unease. To pose the question this way is really to ask how the banner rite works or fails to work in its own terms. In other words, what was going on in the banner rite itself such that Chen might compel Yin Zhao to respond favorably or not? What within the world of the ritual led Chen to agonize? Answering the question posed this way requires a journey deep inside the world of the banner rite. Such a journey shows that Chun's apprehension about his performance of the ritual was in large part driven by concern for whether the ritual would accomplish its liturgical goal, successful communication between ordinate and deity. Communication here implies a relationship between particular subjects. The banner rite is the ritual way that Chun the ordinate hoped to forge a relationship with his lineage's main martial deity, Yin Zhao, supplier of his exorcistic power. Using complicated incantations, visualizations, ritual gestures, and inscriptions, Chun strove to convince Yin Zhao that the two should form an intimate bond. If successful, this bond would last for the rest of Chun's liturgical life. Whenever he would need exorcistic power to serve members of his community, he would call on Yin Zhao and his minions. This talk in the book behind it wager that digging into this one ritual called the Bannerite performed by this one aspiring Taoist master in one particular place will shed light on the workings of ordinary everyday religion throughout large swaths of South China. Pressing on this one ritual performance plunges us deep into a thick web of relationships between masters, aspiring masters, and their local communities, between today's masters and the liturgical lineages that produce them, and most interesting to me, between the masters and the gods, the rituals are designed to put into communication. The payoff of exploring this one ritual performance is that it allows us to see vividly the sophisticated workings of Taoist ritual, which are difficult to get at and so rarely brought to light. Socially contextualizing one ritual affords us glimpses of the lives of ordinary Taoist masters these days in South China and the increasingly faint vestiges, vestiges of the hardships that liturgical ancestors endured during the 20th century. Placing one ritual in its historical context allows us to glean something of the intellectual roots of practices such as the Bannerite and the great liturgical movements of the Song and Yuan dynasties. My talk will unfold now in three parts in a conclusion. Part one. Chun Diwan's performance of the Bannerite is a mode of communication between him and Celestial Lord Yin Zhao in which relationship between budding master and martial deity might be forged. The Bannerite itself recognizes that the possibility of that communication relationship begins with acknowledgement that both Chun and Yin Zhao are subjects. By subject, I mean that both are rooted in particular histories that can be expressed as narratives. And those narratives tell how each has been ensconced in consequential relationships that shape them. Chen and Yin Zhao would also maintain a certain agency, for lack of a better word, during the banner rite. They would, be, they would choose to be active participants in the ritual. What they would do, or perhaps fail to do, and how they would do it would directly affect the outcome, which Chen's anxiety indicated was anything but certain. First, we'll learn something of Chen Yiwen's story and of the consequential relationships that brought him to attempt to become a Taoist priest by means of performing the banner rite. Chen was born in October 1976, nearly a month after Mao Zedong died in the hilly, in the tiny hillside hamlet of Mount Xiaoshan in Anhua County in north central Hunan province. He was a sickly child, and his pious grandmother steadfastly prayed to local deities to heal and protect him. When Chen was coming of age in the 1990s, his corner of Hunan was finally feeling the positive effects of, of Deng Xiaoping's reform and opening up policies instituted in late 1978. The gradual privatization of the Mao era agricultural communes led to the development of commercial crops. Local tangerines and tobacco began to garner a modest market outside the region. The local government mandated that Chun's region concentrate its light manufacturing on ceramics. Small factories producing ceramic goods for commercial businesses, artisans, and households popped up throughout the countryside. But the region's greatest commodity was its people. They joined the 130 million migrant laborers who left their homes in the interior of China to fuel factories, making labor-intensive products in coastal cities. Even Taoist priests and their wives flocked to the coast. 
John Dewan was one of the few who resisted the lure of higher wages on the coast. Instead, he stayed home and worked as a concrete mixer and bricklayer. The local building trades were booming as returning migrant laborers competed to display their newfound wealth by installing shiny white tile facades on their country homes. But Chun's health remained an issue. The constant dust from working with concrete gave him chest pains, so he left the trade. His poor health also made unattractive work as a commercial farmer or in a local factory, let alone on the coast as a migrant laborer. Increasingly desperate and depressed, Chun found himself most interested in the Taoist masters who performed funerals and jowl liturgies for patrons in his local community. I had not done well in high school. My health was not good, and I didn't want to learn a strenuous trade, Chun remembers. I was living a relatively difficult life with a body that just couldn't take it. But I liked the ritual music, so I began to study Taoism. Chun was drawn to the courtly bamboo flute music local masters played as they performed the rituals. He also thought working as, Taoist, as a Taoist priest might also benefit his shaky health. Chun spent four years apprenticing under the watchful eyes of the dozen ordained masters in a local lineage. Like all apprentices, Chun absorbed the rhythms of the rites performed during Taoist Jiao ceremonies for the living and funerals for the dead by learning on the job. During rituals, I would play a little flute, read a few texts, and then listen to my masters sing, Chun says. I slowly studied and imitated them. At first, I could only understand a little. There were a lot of places in the text I had to ask a master to explain. If you live to be an old man, you'd study until you're an old man. There's no way you can understand all of it. You can only get better a little at a time. John was studying to enter a lineage of strictly male masters who, like countless masters across China, marry, live in homes rather than in temples, and often hold secular jobs in addition to minding their liturgical responsibility. Chun's lineage actually considers itself half Buddhist, half Taoist, Ban Fu Ban Dao. Ritual masters perform funerary rites for the dead, which they regard as Buddhist, and therapeutic rituals for the living, which they classify as Taoist. Taoist manuals preserved by the lineage claim that their Taoist traditions originate in the temple, the Jade Boy Palace, or Yu Shu Gong, built in the mid 14th century in Xinhua County, just the south of Chen Diwan's Anhua County. Chen Yi Taoist traditions made their way north and by the mid 17th century were practiced by Chen's liturgical ancestors in the Great Bear Mountains in North Central Hunan. The lineage's Taoist manuals record that the lineage's Buddhist traditions are rooted in exorcistic Buddhist traditions associated with the 12th century monk Huan, who lived and practiced in Northwest Jiangxi province, not far from Chun's region in Hunan. A Chan monk in the Linji tradition, Huan was known for mastering Taoist exorcistic rites. And today, Buddhist exorcistic traditions associated with him flourish throughout South China. Clues from the liturgical manuals preserved by Chun Diwen's lineage suggest that Chun's liturgical ancestors had been simultaneously practicing Zhengi Taoist and Pu'an Buddhist ritual since at least the latter half of the 18th century. By the late 18th or early 19th century, this dual Taoist Buddhist ritual tradition made its way to Chun's home region in Anhua County. Since then, several of Chun's liturgical ancestors have been notable Hunting around the county archive reveals that one of Chun's masters or his liturgical ancestors organized the first Anhua County Taoist Association in July, 1941. The association was recognized by the nationalist government in April, 1942. And that, and that same master was promptly elected as its first executive director by 102 masters from across Anhua, from across Anhua County. A generation later, the eldest of Chun's masters reluctantly tell stories of how they were forced to take up secular employment during intermittent repressions from the 1950s through the late 1980s. Government officials confiscated all music instru musical instruments and ritual accessories. Masters scrambled to hide precious ritual manuals like the ones scripting the Bannerite, which they had been copying by hand down the generations. One master remembers how his father the master who founded the Anhua Daoist Association in the 40s was branded a local despot and a counter-revolutionary. He never recovered from the humiliation and died in 1971. His son mourns that he could never give his father a proper funeral 
according to the rights of their lineage. Yet some masters resisted. A few risked heavy penalty to perform simple funerals and exorcisms for local patrons. Without ritual manuals to guide them, they perform from memory. Without musical instruments, they lightly struck ceramic teacup covers with chopsticks to, sim to uh, simulate percussion while whispering invocations and chants. Finally, around 1990, the freeze on religious expression began to thaw. Masters in Chun's lineage recovered their hidden ritual manuals and piece by piece bought or made new musical instruments. They codified, recopied, and at times redacted their entire repertoire of Taoist and Buddhist ritual manuals. They fashioned new paintings of deities. Lay patrons and local craftspeople rebuilt local temples. Most important, the lineage again began training masters uh, uh, again, I'm sorry, uh, most important, the lineage again began training apprentices such as Chen Diwan. For about 30 years now, the lineage has, knock on wood, been thriving. One of the masters was even elected village head in local grassroots elections. Chen brought all of his personal history to his performance of the banner right. From his healing by a local deity during his youth to his dissatisfaction with conventional ways of making a living, to his interest in the music of the local liturgies, and finally to his years training with his masters. Each of those experiences would contribute to the sincerity and earnestness with which he would test his knowledge and skill by attempting the banner right. But Chun's history was not limited to his personal history. In terms of the banner right, Chun did not stand alone but instead as an aspiring member of the long lineage to which certain Taoist and exorcistic Buddhist practices came together into a coherent liturgical repertoire. Chun would not undertake the ritual on his own, but instead with the assistance of the long line of deceased masters who had transmitted the rites down to his age. Because our rites have come down to us from our masters, one of Chun's masters explained, Communication between us and deities such as Yin Jiao must go through our masters and patriarchs. Every time we perform a ritual event, we must invite the masters of the lineage to witness it. In Chun's performance of the banner rite, he would meticulously invite the entire pantheon of deceased masters to witness the event and request that they endorse his attempt to communicate with and summon Yin Jiao. Chun Di Wen then, is a subject. He has a history, a story profoundly shaped by his personal experiences and by his relationships with his masters who teach him ritual traditions flowing from the lineage stretching back centuries. Chun chooses to participate in the banner rite and with sincere intention attempts to communicate with the martial deity Yin Jiao. Part two, Yin Jiao is also a subject. He too has a history that can be told in a story. And we shall see that he too may choose whether to participate in the banner right, whether to heed Chen's call. Chen knew something about Yin Zhao from two sources maintained by his lineage. First, he observed the liturgical scroll of the God, which hung in the Southeast corner of the altar space constructed for Taoist Zhao or Buddhist funerals. The scroll depicts Yin Zhao with a boyish face, bare feet, two tufts of knotted hair called fork buns, Ya Ji. His hairstyles associated with young children, especially girls, and lends an innocent quality to Yin Jiao. That innocence is juxtaposed with the ferocity evinced in his necklace of 12 skulls and headband fastening a skull across his forehead. He wields two weapons, a great halberd and a golden bell. Chen also repeatedly read a hagiography about Yin Jiao preserved by the lineage. According to the hagiography, Yin Zhao has had 10 lifetimes and into each he was born a crown prince. In his 10th lifetime, Yin was born as the crown prince of the infamous King Zhou, Zhou Wang, the last ruler of the ancient Shang dynasty. The hagiography gives its own twist to the oft told tale of King Zhou. Yin Zhao's mother is miraculously impregnated by the god of the star Purple Tenuity, also known as the Emperor of the North after she was relegated to the back of the palace for questioning the king's habit of making disastrous political decisions on the counsel of his favorite concubine, Su Da Ji. Infuriated that Yin Jiao was not his child, King Zhou kills his mother and leaves, the boy to, and leaves the boy to 
perish in the wilderness. Miraculously, wild animals tend to him and eventually he's rescued by a general named Marquis who raises the boy. Ming Zhao comes of age. He plans to avenge his mother by raising an army to destroy the cruel king and his regime. While searching for skilled military men, he comes across an adept named Shun the Realized One who had been praying for a worthy to come so he can transmit his techniques of self-realization. With some effort, Master Shun convinces Yin Zhao that patricide is against the, the will of heaven. He takes, on the, he takes in the mercurial boy and trains him in the arts of the Tao. When Yin Zhao proves himself ready, Master Shun calls down the high gods and his deceased masters to witness a solemn oath between him and Yin Zhao. Under a mulberry tree, Master Shun vows to teach the boy the methods for directing the great power of thunder and lightning. Shun swears, today I pass on the methods according to the great law. I dare not issue falsity or hide the truth, lest I fall into the Fengdu underworld for eternity and suffer karmic retribution. Should the general Yin turn his back on me, may, heaven, may heavenly thunder destroy him. Yin Jiao bows his head and kowtows. Then Master Shun draws the graph uh, for the well, Jing, on the ground, and he straddles it. In a gesture of utter submission, Yin crouches down onto the graph between Shun's legs and swears. I bow to the realized one as my master until the end of my days I shall not forget. I untie, I untie my silk waistband and divide it between us. I hold the silk and swear to heaven. Should I break the covenant back out of my oath, then I shall certainly spend my next lifetime as a dog. The Emperor of the North hears Yin Zhao's devotion and bestows upon him a halberd, golden bell title, and a secret incantation by which he would be summoned. This iconography and remarkably detailed hagiography, maintained by an ordinary lineage of masters, conveys crucial bits of information about the deity who would play a central role in Chen Diwen's performance of the banner rite. First, the visual imagery portrays Yin Zhao as a youthful, almost cute deity, veiling a terrible ferocity. His boyish face, girlish hairdo, and bare feet belie the ruthlessness with which he terrorizes demons with his halberd and golden bell, as evidenced by the string of trophy skulls around his neck and forehead. Second, the hagiography repeatedly ties Yin Zhao to the emperor of the north. Yin's mother was impregnated by the high god, and the great god later confers to the young man his weapons title and secret incantation, the mechanism for summoning him, which he could presumably reveal to masters as he pleased. Third, the narrative tells how Yin Zhao and Master Shun form a symbiotic relationship cemented in their great oath. Shun pledges to the gods and previous masters that he will withhold nothing of the teachings and practices from Yin Zhao. In turn, Yin vows to serve the Tao by becoming a member of Shun's lineage even humiliating himself in deference to his master. None of this key information about Yin Zhao is invented by Chun's lineage. My book shows that much of the hagiography of Yin Zhao maintained by Chun's lineage is rooted in a hagiography from the late Yuan or early Ming. That text in turn draws on images of Yin Zhao expressed in older ritual manuals that were circulating among particular Taoist lineages during the Song and Yuan dynasties that is the 10th through 14th centuries. During that time, exorcistic methods for summoning and employing a host of martial deities, including Yin Zhao, flourished across ritual traditions. The great medieval Taoist traditions, Celestial Master, Shang Qing, and Ling Bao, and cults to the Northern Emperor were, along with Chan and Tantric Buddhist traditions, appropriated and developed by new Taoist traditions emerging during the Song Dynasty. The correct rites of the heart of heaven, divine Empyrean traditions, and, and pure tenuity traditions, to name a few. These new ritual traditions, which remain woefully understudied, all summoned and employed fierce martial deities, of which Yin Zhao is just one. Mark Mullenbelt of Hong Kong Polytechnic University has shown that late imperial fiction frequently drew on the workings of earlier Taoist ritual. The Yuan Ming hagiography of Yin Zhao is a case in point. His image and story of Yin Zhao 
its image and story of Yin Jiao, boyish, serving the emperor of the north and loyal to a realized master named Shun, seem to have been woven from strands expressed in several liturgical sources from the Song. For example, one dated to 1274 is a correct rites of the heart of heaven manual for summoning Yin Jiao and has obvious divine Imperian overtones. Another is a contemporary or slightly later Puritanuity manual. These ritual texts express imagery and language that were later woven into the Yuanming hagiography of Yin Jiao, large swaths of which somehow made it down the centuries to Chen Diwen's lineage in Hunan. Chen Diwen knew nothing of the provenance of his lineage's hagiography when he studied it during his training. He did not know that there have been many alternatives to the iconography of Yin Jiao on his uh, lineage's ritual scroll. But Chen was acutely aware that his mastery of Yin Zhao's narrative and iconography was crucial for successfully summoning the god during the banner rite. Indeed, the entire story is important because it gives an account of the genealogy of Yin Zhao, Chen explains. If you don't know that, how could you possibly move the marshal when invoking him? Unwittingly, Chen evokes a sentiment by the great 13th a century master of divine Empyrean rites and inner alchemy, Bai Yuchan, who said, when summoning and employing thunder gods, how could one not know whence they came? Like Chen Di Wen then, Yin Zhao is his subject. He has a history, a story profoundly shaped by his personal experiences and by his relationships, especially with the emperor of the north and his master Shun, the realized one. We shall see that Yin may choose to participate in the banner right to communicate with Shani in ritual terms or not. Part three. Finally, these two subjects, Chen Di Wen and Yin Zhao, came together in the banner right on that rainy day in Hunan, each ensconced in their respective social contexts. For his part, Chen's whole personal history, his sickly childhood, his search for a palpable way to make a living, his interest in music, and his years training as an apprentice led to this moment of public ritual performance before the local community. Chen invited the pantheon of gods and deceased masters and asked the latter to bear witness that he was a legitimate ordinant of the lineage and to endorse his attempt to communicate with Yin Zhao and summon him. If Yin Zhao accepted the summons, he would reply to Chen by using the wind and not the five streamers cut into the banner as a sign of his pledge to serve the budding master. No, not we mean Yin Zhao would rebuff the summons and Chen would not be able to be ordained that day. A sloppy loose knot would signal a less than enthusiastic response from the god. Only a well knotted banner could convince the village community that Yin Zhao should be hired as a ritual master. The heart of the banner right consists of the production of a talisman on the blue banner. Talismans are messages to deities or demons, often written in esoteric graphs, which are inscribed on paper, cloth, wood, metal, or in the air. They are ubiquitous in Taoist practice. The efficacy of Tao's manuscript is inextricably bound up with the status of the officiant's body. Before he can actually inscribe the talisman designed to compel Yin Zhao to comply with his summons, Chen Di Wen must charge the talismanic writing with primordial power. Chen transforms his mundane mortal body into a divine body, able to recover his true primordial self. By means of the power of visualization, Chen envelops his body in a protective cone of golden radiance, he incinerates his mundane body, and out of the ashes emerges the divine body of Zhang Daoling, the first Taoist priest and patriarch of all Taoist lineages. Then by means of an inner alchemical visualization, that body transforms into the body of the dark emperor Zheng Wu, a high deity who's often paired with Zhang Daoling in rituals throughout South China. As the rarefied body of Zheng Wu, Chen Di Wen then recovers his true divine self. Variously called the true person of primordial destiny, primordial spirit, or primordial chronogram, the true self is the deepest, most intimate self that was primordially destined or assigned, Yuan Ming, which means it was bequeathed by the Tao at the moment of birth. But the true self normally remains hidden in the formless void of the cosmic primordium. Chun actively calls forth and recovers from the formless void, the secluded self naturally in accord with the Tao. 
that true self is then, is then emitted from his body and manifests in the world as dazzling radiance, filling up the space between heaven and earth. For a fascinating take on this kind of ritual operation from the point of view of existentialist philosophy, uh, I recommend highly the recent book by Paul Anderson of the University of Hawaii in Manila. Let's take a look now at what the ritual sequence I just described looks like. Notice the monotonous percussive rhythm of the gong and cymbal that accompanies the ritual action. There's no courtly flute music here. The droning helps the efficient sustain a high level of concentration. As Chen works through the sequence with the lineage's manual open on the altar table in front of him, one of his witnessing masters looks on to ensure that Chen does not commit any major gaffes. The support of the masters extends even to the organ's actual performance of the banner rite in real time. Having recovered his primordial divine self by means of this operation, Chun then visualizes that he travels to the celestial court of the Emperor of the North and requests an imperial edict that In Jiao obey the summons. A little later on, Chun begins to inscribe the talisman, which is composed of over a hundred distinct graphs. The first graph, which Chun's lineage calls the ancestral chi of the primordium, signals that the entire talisman to follow is itself an expression of the pristine chi flowing from the stillness of the primordium, which was tapped by Chun when he recovered his primordial self. The efficacy of the talisman script is inextricably bound up with the ontological state of Chun's body. His divine self exudes the pure, undifferentiated ancestral chi breathed by the Tao to form the nascent cosmos at the primordium and breathed by the Tao to form Chun's true self at his conception. Chun channels that potent ancestral chi into the very talisman itself. He visualizes that he saturates the ink, the brush and ink with the chi from his divine body and imbues every stroke of every graph with it. The inscription of each graph is simultaneously accompanied by a breathy incantation and a, visualiza and a visualization. The talisman itself is not simply made of ink, but instead composed of pure ancestral chi flowing from Chun's inscription, incantation, and imagination. It is the ontological weight of the language of the talisman that allows it to resonate with the gods, who are also largely made of ancestral chi. Talismanic script is not simply signification, 
It is a material expression of the primordial reality shared by the gods on high. Next, John inscribes four characters that read, the emperor of the north decrees. They identify the entire talisman as the edict from the emperor of the north acquired by Chun when, he, when his divine self ascended to the god celestial court. As Chun inscribes the graphs, he follows along the ritual manual on the altar table he memorized to encant. The emperor of the north himself raises celestial troops. He musters the myriad spirits. The great emperor has a decree that today I implement. Marshal Lin Jiao quickly complied. The talisman display, the talisman plays on the hierarchical relationship between Lin Jiao and the Emperor of the North. Recall from the lineage's hagiography that Lin was born by the miraculous impreg impregnation of his mother by the Emperor. Later, the High God conferred to Lin Jiao his weapons, title, and incantation. As he inscribes and incants, Chun visualizes that he is making a bold declaration to Lin Jiao that Chun ascended to the heavenly court and secured proper authority to summon the martial deity. The declaration aims to compel Yin Zhao to recognize his administrative duty to his celestial superior. Further down the talisman, Chun inscribes and incants Yin Zhao's heart seal. A heart seal is a kind of taboo name held both by deities and masters. With roots in Chan Buddhist ideas of mind-to-mind -mind transmission of the Dharma between a master and a disciple, knowledge of a god or master's heart seal connotes that the possessor has received essential teachings about that god from that master, or, uh, which have been passed down heart to heart, mouth to mouth, down to generations without variation, like a seal impressing an identical imprint on one heart or mind after another. Heart seals function as a kind of marker of an efficient lineage identity. The ability to produce them shows gods and masters that they have indeed been inducted into the traditions of the lineage's esoteric liturgical know-how. Yin Zhao's heart seal is a highly stylized derivation of his name, Jiao. This particular production of Yin Zhao's heart seal hangs together with several subsequent graphs and incantations which Chun produces one on top of the other to form a thick ball of charged ink at the bottom of the talisman. Here's what that ritual sequence looks like. As Chen inscribes Yin Zhao's heart seal, he encants. You, Yin Zhao, pointed to heaven and pledged an oath. You pointed to earth and made a covenant. As soon as this heart seal is brought forth, Yin Zhao will appear. The language of the incantation directly evokes the oath Yin Zhao made to his master, Shun the Realized One, under a mulberry tree, which was recorded in the lineage's hagiography, the scene of which Chun visualizes. A little further down, Chun inscribes the graph of a stylized mulberry tree as he encants. Yin Jiao, Yin Jiao, hear me urge you over and over again. Underneath the mulberry mm -hmm. grove, you already struck a covenant. Chun continues to the next graph, the components of which can literally be read as the sun and moon bear witness. You pointed to the sun and pledged an oath. You pointed to the moon and made a covenant. As soon as this hard seal is brought forth, Yin will appear. A little further in the manual, Chun inscribes the graph for dot. As Chun draws, he incants, if you, Yin Zhao, keep your pledge, you yourself will descend. If you do not keep your pledge, you will turn into a dog for the next lifetime. The last phrase of the incantation is circled in red ink in the text. 
to alert the officiant that he should visualize a dog instead of uttering the terrible verse. This remarkable sequence of talismanic graphs and incantations, reminding Zhao of his duty to his master, Shun the Realized One, who is a patriarch of Chun's lineage. Chun displays membership in that lineage by producing in Zhao's esoteric heart seal, which he learned from his masters who, they believe, receded down the generations from Shun himself. Shun knows in Zhao's story in which the graphs and incantations are rooted. The lineage's hagiography is baked into the talisman itself. By enacting that narrative in talismanic language, Chun communicates in Zhao's history and words back to him hoping to evoke the emotions that might spur the mercurial God to action. Those emotions progress throughout the sequence. Yin Zhao is first invited to reminisce about his intimate relationship with the master who saved him from calamity and led him to awaken to the Tao. The graphs and incantations tug at Yin Zhao's sense of filial piety and moral duty, gently shaming him to respond to the summons. The sequence ends with a threat Yin Zhao is reminded of the terrible consequence of refusal to comply in terms so harsh, the ordinate is instructed not to utter them. The graphs and incantations end up cajoling Yin Zhao into doing what is right under pain of karmic penalty. Shun cannot simply command the deity to obey. He must persuade him. Indeed, there have been times when Yin Zhao has not complied. Ordinations and entire careers have been damaged and even abandoned. Our deep dive into the workings of the banner right revealed that both Chun Di Wen and Yin Zhao are indeed subjects. They each have a history that can be articulated in narratives telling how consequential relationships shape both. They each have a certain agency. Chun chooses to enter the lineage and learn the banner right and can do so with more or less diligence. Yin Zhao chooses whether or not to knot the banner and how nice and tight the knot should be. All of this comes to bear in the performance of the banner right. It makes us see that this kind of Taoist ritual is a sophisticated mode of ritual communication. It is a site in which socially located subjects, both human and divine, express themselves to one another in symbolic language. Conclusion. I won't spoil the book right, and tell you whether Yin Zhao replied. You'll just have to find out for yourself. Instead, I want to articulate something about a a few of the methodological and theoretical moves performed by this talk and the monograph behind it. First, this research is a kind of methodological experiment in how to integrate ethnography and text historical analysis. Instead of beginning with ethnographic data about living people and then scouring textual sources for historical context of their group or condition, this book focuses intensely on the phenomenon of a single performance of a single ritual by a particular person. This is a classic approach in the phenomenology of religion, an increasingly rare style of scholarship, especially in the study of Chinese religion. This approach gives a very close reading of a religious phenomenon, such as a ritual performance, and tries to get inside it. It tries to account for what the ritual means in its own terms. Those terms are necessarily rooted in the lives of participants, which color their interpretations and even assumptions about what the ritual means. Those terms are also rooted in the manuscripts surrounding the ritual to which participants have access. Especially in the book, I hunt for the intellectual roots of those interpretations in speech and manuscript in extant textual sources. Many of those sources are hagiographies, and also theoretical treatises and ritual manuals laid down by sophisticated Taoist theorists, trying to figure out their rituals and how they work during the Song and Yuan periods. I try to show that certain of those intellectual terms are baked into the ritual performance of the Bannerite itself. They have made their way twisting and turning into the interpretations and assumptions of practitioners and into the liturgy and into the liturgical texts they use just as we saw that a certain hagiography of Yin Zhao is baked into, the, into Chen's performance of the banner right, so have a host of Taoist ideas and practices from centuries past been baked into the banner right. Second, 
This research offers an atypical way of studying ritual, especially Taoist ritual. It reads different from classic studies. What is important in most of those studies is the ritual action. What is done when? The meaning of ritual hangs in the structure of events, in the sequence in which they occur. So those studies tend to give overviews of large swaths of ritual repertoires. They look for large liturgical structures that are not that not only organize ritual, but also the community practicing it. In these approaches, what I've been calling subjects, both human and I insist divine, tend to melt away. They become rather passive components or consequences of ritual action. They become functions of a liturgical structure. These approaches are heavily influenced by Durkheimian and structuralist ideas, which have dominated the study of ritual during most of the 20th century. Instead of looking for broad liturgical structures that shape ritual forms and organize society, this book drills down into moments of ritual life and then contextualizes those moments in thick social, historical, and cosmological frames. When we do that, we notice that ritual, at least the theory of ritual assumed by the Bannerite and its performers, privileges what I have been calling subjects. Ritual puts human and divine subjects in connection by providing a symbolic language with which they may communicate with one another. Now, for any theory heads who may be in the audience, this idea is not far off from uh, Mikhail Bakhtin's linguistic notion of utterance. An utterance is any unit of language, from a single word or gesture, to an entire text like a novel or dance, to a ritual like the banner rite, through which one subject speaks with another. Every utterance is like a little drama in which a speaker conveys some meaning to a listener and a listener responds. Utterances are entirely social. They take place between speakers in particular situations, saturated by social factors. You saw that Chun is ensconced in his personal history as Yin Zhao is in his. We saw how they speak to one another in the symbolic terms of the Bannerite. Today's talk and the book behind it try to show how much is learned about the workings of Taoist ritual and the subjects who participate in it when we move away from looking at ritual as a structure and more as an utterance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liu Xun, would you direct the questions maybe? Um, okay, uh, so now we begin our um, question and answer session, and uh, uh, we can have a discussion with David. Uh, it's a fascinating talk that reveals the very insight of the Taoist clerical consecration process and the ritual that actually was in the center of that and takes us into a really a wonderful journey. So thank you, David. And uh, uh, for those of us who actually have questions, we can either you know, click the sign on the uh, there. You know, show a, a sign like uh, you can you can click the sign, and both John Tao and I will recognize you right away. Or you can also perhaps post the questions in chat as well. So uh, right now we have one, uh, two actually quite a few two from uh, Ken He. Uh, David, can you read? By the way, do we are we sharing this with David as well? Or should I read I can it? See, I can see one chat, but I think it'd be helpful for everyone okay. if you read it as well. Um, there were two questions from uh, Kenny, uh, Kenny Ho. Um, would you consider, first, would you consider living Taoist practitioner communi communication to deity something comparable to the Taiwanese Tonggi, 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 or Tongji, or Ji Tong? And these are spirit medium. Um, uh, their ritual performance. This is, of course, the first uh, question. Any comparison at all? The should I go to the second question? Maybe you can take both. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, go to the second, then I'll. The um, yeah. All right. In one of the slides, you showed, of course, the calligraphy te calligraphic text of uh, Long Live the Emperor, Huang Di Wan Sui, three times. That is very interesting. I am thinking about uh, on kings by David Graber, uh, Graber 
uh, Marshall Salin, Marshall Salin, and um, does that mean king equals emperor uh, is higher than god or demon, or a sense of hierarchy in society, in human versus god, and Taoism, spiritual world, and etc. Or um, the emperor really means emperor in the spiritual world. Uh, would you elaborate on that? So there are two parts. Uh, okay, well, thank you, uh, Kenneth. Um, I appreciate the questions. Um, so the first question here about Taiwanese uh, Tong Chi. Um, so I think we have, I, I don't know the answer, but the question is, is instructive because we have to keep in mind that there's not just one theory of ritual in any of these traditions. These are big, huge, diverse, complicated, long traditions that have been developing in different, throughout, in different lineages over centuries and centuries. So there are many theories of ritual, I think, at play. Uh, and so uh, I, what I gave you today uh, is one theory of ritual that is at play in this kind of rite called the banner rite. Um, to me, it's an open question how applicable this um, theory of ritual is elsewhere, right? I wager it is, um, but I wouldn't uh, presume that it's explicable everywhere. Uh, so I think the, the first question is really instructive for us because it begs, it begs the question, right? Well, let's get into then the ritual of the spirit medium uh, and see what the relationship is between that medium and the deity. I'll bet it's different, right? I, I don't know how it's different, but I'll bet it's different. I'll bet the, the, the sort of relationship of, uh, I can't imagine a spirit medium, uh, well, maybe I'm wrong, but would a spirit medium cajole a deity the way, um, the way uh, uh, Chun did when he's cajoling Yin Jiao with the use of his heart seal? Would he threaten him? Maybe. Maybe, right? Um, so I think the, 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 the question raised is a great question because it opens up then that kind of exploration. And I think this is sort of what we need to do in the study of China, uh, Chinese religion. I think we need to sort of get in there and then ask these kinds of questions uh, before we kind of come up with a kind of big, huge universal theories. Um, so I really appreciate this question and I really encourage uh, Ken perhaps to, to find out the answer for us, right? And publish it somewhere where we can learn. Um, Okay, uh, the second question is interesting, right? Uh, so yeah, so if you uh, looked at some of the ritual manual that I didn't talk about today, uh, there is this phrase, long live the emperor, right? Huang Di Wan Sui. Uh, I think that this is, um, my reading of this is that it is uh, um, uh, an indication that you know, these texts were, uh, came about uh, or redacted last uh, in the Qing period, perhaps earlier. Um, where the emperor is in play. The emperor is in the cosmic hierarchy, right? The emperor is uh, respected, uh, the living emperor, right? The emperor of China is respected as uh, having a certain kind of authority and efficaciousness here. That the emperor is folded in them with these high gods is indeed fascinating, right? But I, it is, I think it is the real emperor here. Uh, and um, yeah, I appreciate uh, Ken's um, um, sort of noticing that. I don't know this text by Graeber and Solomons. Um, is the emperor higher than the god or demon? Um, well, yeah, uh, some gods and demons and, and lower than others, right? So the emperor is lower than say the emperor of the north and other very, very high Taoist gods, um, but much higher than other deities like Yin Jiao. Um, so um, yeah, again, another great question, uh, I think. I hope that helps. All right, uh, let's go to uh, Mario um, Tocheski. Um, it's your turn. Could you unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving the opportunity to ask also. Uh, thank you for the very informative and wonderful uh, presented summary of the book. Um, couple, of, uh, couple of questions, if you don't mind, which are really not uh, kind of related to the central topic of, of your talk, they are more about things you just mentioned uh, in passing. Uh, the first one is about uh, uh, the continuation of this kind of Taoist traditions, localized Taoist tradition during the Cultural Revolution. You mentioned a little bit 
how they were kind of keeping pots and, and trying to do rituals uh, in secret and, and so on. And kind of this is interesting because, I mean, in terms of studying the culture of evolution, religion under the culture of evolution, there have been many books, but in terms of having comprehensive religious history of the culture of evolution, I think there is, uh, um, Th that's something that is lacking as far as unless I'm missing something and the people who participate in these kind of things are kind of passing away I mean they're kind of the, the source of information would be interviews with people who were um, living there and maybe trying to transmit uh, this tradition and uh, dealing with the consequences so this is the first question I, again I'm sorry it's not directly related to, to your research but perhaps you can tell us something um, um, uh, relevant about it. The second one is you're dealing with this uh, local tradition uh, or local expressions of, of Taoist ritual um, within their original context, in this case Hunan and, and, and so forth. But you also mentioned that many of the people, unlike the main subject of your study, went and became uh, uh, migrant workers in other parts of China. So I was wondering what's happening to this kind of tradition? Are they transmitted, for example? Are there some of these local people kind of go there, concentrate, maybe have go to work somewhere in Shanghai or, or Tianjin or some place like that. And is there some kind of sense of transmission of these traditions outside of you know their local context and how does that play? And usually this will be a large urban con uh, uh, context because that's where people I presume usually go to find work and uh, make more income and support their families. So. Uh, um, I look forward to your answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mario, uh, for those questions. Um, maybe the second question I'll, I'll uh, respond to first. So these migrant workers, yeah, it's fascinating. And my collaborator, uh, photographer Doug Cantor, followed um, um, many, uh, several of these Taoists down to Shenzhen and, and Dong, uh, Dongguan uh, uh, and took, you know, just, just stunning photos of them, you know, just you know, working often as security guard guards and sometimes in factories. Um, so you would think that uh, the the migrant labor, which was really at its peak in the, the 90s and early 2000s and has is still going on, but it's not as intense as it was, uh, at least in this corner of Hunan where I work. Um, you think that that would dilute these traditions in a way, or it would change them, impact them somehow. But it's impacting them, I found, in a way that may not be intuitive is actually sort of causing a doubling down on the commitment to locality. So uh, I saw this uh, in two ways. One, when these uh, 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 Taoist priests were going to places like Shenzhen or Dongguan, and uh, they would only uh, tend then uh, religiously to the religious needs of people who were from the locale. If you were not from their hometown, didn't speak the same dialect, and they didn't know of you, um, then uh, they simply would not deal with those ritual needs. So uh, this worked because so many migrant laborers, then like migration patterns, um, followed um, friends and relatives from the same place to the same factories. So there were like micro communities then uh, of, 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 of people from the same Laojia, um, the same hometown, um, then that expressed itself religiously. So there's a kind of then reinforcement then of, of a local identity. The second way in which I notice this, this, this doubling down is fascinating. And that is that when uh, the most intellectually aggressive of these masters were sort of putting their tradition back together around 1990 after 35 or so years of intermittent repression, um, they did a lot of redaction, meaning that they cleaned up, they edited, and sometimes they added things to these texts. So these traditions are living. Uh, only the most sort of intellectually um, confident and dedicated uh, priests would actually attempt this. But there were a few who did, and I talk about this a bit in the book. In one way, one of the masters, actually the most intellectual of them and the, the one who recopied most of this lineage's uh, ritual repertoire and the manuals that compose it. He actually added a lot of the so-called uh, oral transmissions, this Chuan, to the ritual manuals. So a ritual manual actually has two voices 
Bakhtin would say, my, my friend Bakhtin would say, two, two voices, at least in, in the text. One is what is written in the text, right? The kind of instructions um, for the manual uh, or instructions for the ritual like the Bannerite. But there's always a component then that isn't written that is kept oral and that you would have to learn then uh, directly from masters. Uh, so this is, you know, this is an old idea. Like Taoist traditions have this idea. Buddhist traditions have this idea. Um, and what happened in the 90s is that the, the, the master who was redacting a, a, a text like the Bannerite was worried that so many of his uh, disciples were off laboring on the coast that they were not getting a good education in the oral tradition. So he started writing the oral tradition down. And this isn't surprising for those of us who read um, sort of Taoist and Buddhist texts. Uh, he had to apologize for that, sort of saying, yeah, I shouldn't write this down. I know that, but here's why I'm doing that. Because the, the, the secrecy is what maintains then uh, the, the, the preciousness uh, and the esoteric nature of these rituals. So in Taoist, uh, sort of Shangqing tradition, Zhang Chaoran has written uh, really well on this in Shangqing traditions and Taoist traditions. I mean, there's, I'm sure the Buddhist uh, studies folks among us can tell us uh, all about who has written on this sort of thing. So this, this, this migrant labor business is actually sort of um, making stronger than um, a notion of place and um, a kind of precision uh, in the ritual performances that weren't there. The same master who was writing those oral transmissions into the text told me he was ordained in 1946. And he told me he thought that the, uh, his, his disciples, are, are Dallas these days are performing the rituals better than when he was ordained. And he attributes that partly then to the fact that, you know, they're more precise because he's been writing this stuff down. So I hope that gets at your question. Uh Thank you, uh, David. Uh, Mario, may I actually, David, with your indulgence, may I use my privilege and shamelessly push forward mm -hmm. uh, a co-authored chapter in a book that just recently came out and uh, which uh, Vansan Gosard and I edited. Uh, I also was uh, part of the author together with the late Professor Mei Li of Central China Normal University in Wuhan. And in the city of Wuhan, actually, there is actually a community of people coming out of Xinhua as well as Anhua and all these areas. Mm. So this, this, this issue of immigration or a, you know, migration actually dates back to the probably even you know, Ming, as early as Ming, and, but of course, most, uh, in a mo most aggressive manner during the, actually the post-Taiping suppression. That is beginning from the mm. second half of, um, um, the, uh, of the 19th century, when out of Hunan came, of course, these volunteers and these militia who put down the suppression uh, who put on the Taiping rebels. And with this, of course, uh, they became the dominant political and military forces in China as well. So uh, as immigrant actually from Xinhua and from Anhua settled in the city of Hankou, and there were already a community. And so as the trade goes, most of these people are actually, uh, um, you know, wood uh, limber merchants and craftsmen and sailors and all that. So as they settled in, Shanghai, in Wuhan, and they actually had a community developed and they actually the Xinhua Dao is now settled in Wuhanko. So exactly the same situation. Of course, after the Deng Xiaoping reform, you have the second, another wave of an immigrant a community set up in that city where actually the Dao is traveled with the merchants, with the trade as well. So let me just shut some. We now have a question from uh, Professor Chuck Woodridge and he actually has maybe a, a, a simple sort of a clarification uh, question. So in the video of the ritual, there was a woman holding a child in the background. Is she a subject in your terms? Okay. Or perhaps is she a subject in the ritual's terms, in the Bannerite's terms? It mm -hmm. might be a way to, to put that, uh, that question. Yeah, absolutely, right? Uh, all the patrons are those who are observing and, and benefiting um, uh, somehow uh, are, are subjects. Um, yeah, uh, I, what's underneath this question is, yeah, uh, is that Chuck is sort of getting at is that there's a sort of limitation, I think, to at least the way I'm going about this particular study. And that I really do focus on, on the sort of two subjects that the banner right sort of puts at the center. 
And, I, and in the book, it's a little uh, fleshed out a little more, but I try to sort of situate them in relationships. And yeah, the Chun, Chun, Chun Diwen, our ordinand, is certainly in relationship with this woman um, uh, holding the child who's just fascinating. The other old woman actually who comes up on his left in that clip is his grandmother, um, which because this was performed in his grandparents' house where he was living at the time. Uh, so, um, I just haven't, yeah, I just haven't gotten there, <laughs> right? Um, I think that like, like consensual circles, a study like this can just get wider and wider and wider. And I think that starting uh, 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 an analysis of this ritual from her point of view, from this woman holding the baby's point of view, would be a fantastic way to go. Very different study, which shed light on very different things. Um, there are also a host of cooks often for these large jiao and funerals who, who come uh, and participate. They're all subjects, right? They're all part of the ritual, right? And so uh, I think, uh, yeah. Um, Chuck, would you like to build on your yeah. sort of yeah. follow up comments that you said uh, rather, I guess, uh, tersely? I guess and the problem of speaking. So why didn't you yet take Yeah, so, so I mean, I was just reacting to Bakhtin, who I haven't read in years, yeah. but um, yeah. but but uh, your interest in subject, uh, the idea of the subject in Bakhtin seemed to be about speaking. Um, yeah. But of course, there are all sorts of people involved in rituals who don't have speaking parts. And that was kind of the um, yeah. what I was trying to get at. Yeah, uh, in fact, Bakhtin, at least in his later works, would define, well, even his earlier works, would define speaking broadly, action, Speaking, showing up for this woman here. I mean, if you know, showing up behind Chen Diwen as he's as he's participating in this uh, our our speech acts uh, for Bakhtin, and so he would he would take that seriously. Uh, so uh, you know, Bakhtin is always trying to sort of press for the, the sort of multi vocality or multi you know this this sort of you know not monol monolithic speech right, but all a, a panoply of plethora of different kinds of speech all going on at once. And for Bakhtin, he thought this was what was going on in Russian novels, Dostoevsky. I mean, this is what he's doing, right? But I, I think it has fantastic sort of like, it's good to think with, I think, when thinking about something as complicated and complex as a ritual, where so much is going on at once. Um, I think Chuck's question raises uh, another valid question about studying ritual or really any cultural form this rich. You know, all of us, analysts uh, in some way, or whenever we begin to talk about it or write about it, you know, we do, a, we do violence to it. We, we, we choose some things to talk about and not others. I, I talk about so little in the banner, right? In, 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 actually, it's so much richer than I could possibly get at. It would take 10 volumes, you know, to actually write about it as richly as possible, as, as it deserves. So I think we have to be humble about that and just sort of own up then to to the particular sorts of entry points and questions that we as scholars ask and, and, and own up to what we're not asking, what we're not seeing. There's always more to the story than what any of us are telling. So I appreciate the question a lot. It's important. Well, we're waiting for more questions to come in. Uh, for now, uh, let me just abuse my right as, a, as my uh, pejorative as a co-host here. Um, you describe actually at the moment when you were showing that, uh, um, you know, uh, Chen Wendi actually writing down a talisman on a cloth, a sort of a banner, there as you go, as you went step by step, and also uh, in the section in the where you show actually the, the video, and you describe actually what was going on inside him. You know, he, you described the scenes of uh, uh, his visualizing scenes and. Um, I'm wondering whether these bodily scenes or the scenes about the bodily transformations and so on, are these what he narrated to you afterwards in your in, or interview with him? Or is it from, of course, we, ha we have, we read all these things in the text. And so I wondered about, you know, the way you describe them, are they directly expressly from him? And is that from his immersive sort of uh, experience of text reading? therefore producing something that is sort of a textual regimen or textual sort of a, you know, a, a, a trope? Or is it something special at all? It'd be, is something personal at all? Because you, you talk about the, 
the infusion, the primordial qi and all that. Uh, so I wondered whether that is your own sort of, uh, probably not, I'm just conject, I'm, I'm just speculating whether that is from your own sort of, a, um, sort of a, not speculating, but it'd be sort of excava excavated sort of a bodily scenes that you read in the text and which seem by all means uh, befitting of the moment or commensurate to that experience that uh, you you observed and you're now describing. Yeah, so 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 Liu Xun is really asking about method here. Um, um, well, first, um, so uh, all of what I showed you is heavily scripted, and even heavier scripted than traditional because uh, the Taoists I just told you about wrote down a lot of the uh, oral transmissions as well. Um, and so, so it's heavily scripted, but, you know, uh, you know, Bakhtin, Roy Rappaport, other folks who take the idea of ritual as a kind of symbolic language, seriously, a guy named Larry Sullivan, who I think with quite a bit of historian of religion, um, Kimberly Patton at Harvard, um, they, uh, the idea is, um, that even though you are performing something that is scripted and even rehearsable and, and reproducible from a text, you're still doing it in a particular way, much like I'm speaking a language in a grammar that is accepted and somewhat public, but I'm speaking it in a particular way, right? And so I'm putting my imprint on the sort of standard English grammar that I'm using right now. And I think that these the ritual sort of works like that. Like Chen is putting his, his, his way of doing these rituals, even though they're scripted. Um, at times he does put sort of a, a kind of stamp of individual pra practice in, he, he sneaks in into the, into the performance. Uh, I would talk about this a bit at the, in the book. At the very end, when he finishes the talisman after like a good half hour of writing, oh, you know, hundreds of, of, of talismanic graphs, he adds a few. They're not in the text. They're not in the oral tradition. And, and the way I learned that is, is my method that you're getting at is I would then film this, of course, and then I would show these films then with a group of these priests, including Chun and his masters, the ones who are interested. And we'd watch the film and we'd read, read through the manuscripts together. And then they would sort of talk around it. And I would record all that. And it was fascinating because you talk about multivocality, like they were, they would argue quite a bit. Right? And, and so my sort of dumb foreigner questions actually brought out a kind of engagement with their own tradition that they wouldn't typically have. So the tradition's sort of alive in a sense. Uh, so when we got to the end and I noticed, I asked John, I said, hey, you know, you are adding some, some graphs here at the end that don't seem to be in the manual, what's going on? He says, oh, well, these are the heart seals of the three masters above me, my transmission master, his master, and the master above him. Because uh, masters also have heart seals, which I, I talk about in the book. And I said, why? He said, oh, I just added it. And immediately one of his masters says, you shouldn't have done that. No need. <laughs> and so I sort of chastised him. <laughs> and so Chum was ashamed of it, uh, where he was sort of proud that he was doing something in an individual way. Uh, and then he, uh, he was embarrassed. So, 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 so the, yeah, so I guess what I'm trying to do in this kind of scholarship, this sort of phenomenological approach that I'm talking about is I'm trying to sort of like get at that richness, that, um, you know, that sense of dynamism that I think these traditions have, like they're codified and yet not codified. They're scripted and yet those, the, you know, the, they're not just scripted, right? They're performed. The real text is the, is, is, is the, the, the performance of the ritual, not the manual. And historically, those of us who studied Chinese ritual, especially Taoist ritual, have really focused on manuals. But uh, I think that's a, a little misplaced. I think that we need to focus on the ritual performance. The manuals are sort of paratexts of that. In, uh, Thank you for uh, uh, Let's yeah. go to uh, two other questions that are posted in the chat. The first one is from now, uh, and Chamath uh, Pereira. And the question that the uh, posted reads as follows, what concept or concepts do you find useful in characterizing the relationship between Taoism in uh, and in Buddhism, both among ritual specialists amongst, as well as lay communities? 
does syncretism suffice? Or would you prefer Bakhtin's uh, holy polyphony, 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 or other concepts? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, so this is the question I think that those of us working in South China in these sort of dual Taoist Buddhist and there's even local traditions, you know, Shi Jiao or traditions of the masters that are going on as well. Uh, some places, Christian traditions, right? Uh, of course, everyone is dealing with Confucian, sort of deep Confucian sort of ideas and practices. Uh, you know, this notion of syncretism. Syncretism, I think most people agree, is just not that useful, right? It, 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 it's not terribly helpful analytically. It sort of just describes like there's, it's a mess out there, right? The, the world is messy. Ritual life is messy. Um, yeah, I haven't figured this out because this is really what I'm going for in one of my, my next project, you know, where I'm looking at the, the Buddhist funeral of a Taoist master. Uh, actually, the, the the master who redacted most of these texts died in 2018. Uh, Liu Xun uh, uh, um, sort of alluded to him. Um, I went to the field with another photographer co collaborator of mine. And he took pictures that were published in the Washington Post. Uh, his name is Nick Otto, O-T-T-O. -T -T -O. If you Google it, you can find those pictures. They're stunning. Uh, and so how do we make sense of these, you know, these these, these, these Taoist traditions in the middle of a Buddhist funeral. Um, you know, the study of Pu'an here, this exorcistic Buddhist Chan monk uh, from the 13th century or 12th century. Uh, Tam Wai Lun is leading the way on that research at Chinese University of Hong Kong. So I think this question it, we, is still up in, you know, it's, it's, it, the jury's out. You know, we haven't done enough work, I think, to actually sort of come up with a, a, a good analytic way to sort of deal with, with, with just the complexity of, of lived religion on the ground. Uh, I'm partial to Bakhtin's notion of polyphony, but you know, we're thinking with Bakhtin's notions here. We're not just taking them as theoretical truths that we then apply on Chinese life. That's, that's not a good way of going about it. We're, we're thinking with these ideas in order to ask a question. Is something like Bakhtin's notion of polyphony going on in what I'm looking at right now? So I don't have a good answer for you, but again, I, I, I like the question a lot. Right. Uh, the next one I will go to actually uh, uh, Elena, but first uh, um, your old friend, I guess uh, your, your friend from Harvard, uh, uh, this is uh, Evelyn Tucker. Mary, are you online? Maybe you could speak. Uh, if not, she basically said, thanks so much, David. Wonderful job. Love to discuss this uh, more at a uh, later date. So. If uh, I, I don't know whether I can quite, quite see, but then um, Jason, you will come after uh, Elena, who has her hand raised. So, Elena, please. Thank you. That's uh, thank you for a wonderful, um, wonderful talk and uh, great perspective. And uh, I'm, I'm really interested in kind of looking at it, um, looking at uh, uh, spirit writing um, it, with with this perspective that you have sort of mm -hmm. trying to apply that to, uh, idea of the you know direct connection between the deity and the um, practitioner um, so that's one thing that I was just thinking but in terms of the syncretism we all agree that syncretism is just not um, just not enough just not not explicatory really of what's really going on um, and I've also really had a hard time uh, with this, uh, with explaining, uh, you know, uh, the, the presence of different gods and the presence of dis different textual traditions in one ritual without any, without there seemingly to be any problem. And, um, and anyways, I just wanted to point out uh, David Palmer, I don't know if you've seen his, uh, I think he, uh, he gave a talk recently uh, and about a situation, um, a ritual in which there were, you know, Buddhist and Taoist in, in, in Northern Guangdong, um, uh, both the uh, Buddhist and Taoist elements. And he was talking, he was explaining it as uh, polyontological pluralism, um, which, you know, you would have to go and, and I think he's publishing an article about it, but basically understanding, um, uh, understanding these uh, traditions as uh, used at the same time, uh, but um, for different uh, uh, for different uh, 
reasons for different with having different roles within the ritual. So not really uh, syncretic, meaning that you know they're just coming together and mixing up, but really uh, used uh, by the same priests, uh, but for uh, in different uh, in different ways. So in his case, he was talking about a ritual that had Wen and Wu um, elements. And um, uh, the, the Wen element was a Buddhist element and the Wu element was a Taoist element. And, and he was explaining how each one of these had its own function within the ritual. And that the same priests you know, were actually walking back and forth between two altars that had these two different roles and doing completely different things, uh, but, but, but the, same, the same people doing, you know, uh, embodying two different roles that were both necessary within the ritual. So I just wanted to point this out. This is not my idea. It's uh, David Palmer's idea. And I just wanted to point out another way in which people have been trying to explain this relationship. Thank you. Thank you. I, that resonates a lot with what I, I'm seeing. Um, you know, again, I, I haven't really focused on this question of the sort of Buddhist Taoist relations, but I am now. Um, but this different uses idea that David Palmer is, is bringing up. Um, what I noticed, reason, one of the reasons syncretism isn't that helpful is because there's all kinds of internal boundaries that practitioners themselves and the texts that they're relying on, including performed texts are making. People know, people are clear much of the time, well, this is Buddhist, uh, what, they're call, what they're at least labeling Buddhist for a certain reason, this is Taoist for another reason. And there's all kinds of internal boundaries and we have to sort of parse that. I, I think, which sounds like yeah, you know, what David is, is getting into in northern Guangdong. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you for that tip. I, I'll check it out. Yeah, if, uh, if I can just uh, interject, it's sort of it's it actually David uh, gave a talk in March this yeah. year, and then it's uh, his talk on exactly that topic, and uh, you can actually check out our video section uh, to to get the talk. So I, I I I was at the talk. I guess I didn't. Really Remember that you it was you sponsoring it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You were yeah, you were at the at the talk. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, not not that not not right. that we're claiming credit or anything, but that's yeah. a good plug right there. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Can, can Rutgers, we Rutgers Center for Chinese Studies. That's yes. you know, yeah, the center right. we, we, we own them, <laughs> yes. Can, can I can we go to the next question? And after that, we'll have the maybe the last one. Uh Jason, if you are online, could you maybe, you know, uh, you know, maneuver your own question there? Uh, there you go, Jason. Uh, you got to unmute yourself. Sorry, I, um, we've got a new puppy and there's just a great deal of uh, urgent chaos in the environment. So I was, uh, this great talk, Dave, and I'm sorry to have had my uh, camera off and be lurking. Um, I, I've always found your work on ritual very interesting and really thought provocative, just very provocative as a historian. Uh, and I find that I'm dealing with limited sources and I find that your ethnographic work is really inspiring for challenging me to think differently about how I think about something like a liturgical manual that I might deal with structurally. And you seem to, in your work, do this uh, rare and valuable thing of doing both history and ethnography, which is rare in the academy just generally. Um, and so I was thinking about uh, a Bakhtinian utterance and trying to think about how I might use the sources that I do have uh, in the song to try to write something that looks a little different from just analyzing the structure. Uh, but since you're probably a few moves ahead of me, I was wondering if you had any tips on how you think about the sources that you do have, the ones that allow you to make these kinds of different, um, different kinds of academic narratives that aren't just looking at structures. Uh, and I just was hoping you could talk more about that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, um, yeah. Uh, so, I, yeah, I think it depends on where you begin. So I think it's easier for people like me because I begin with a living, breathing sort of ritual performance that is just oozing context. And then I sort of try to get inside of it. And then I try to see what echoes or ideas or practices are sort of, again, baked into it from the past. And so I do, uh, so it's a kind of genealogical way of going. And I find that easier, right? Um, and, and Bakhtin has this wonderful image of uh, an utterance. He sort of says that any usage of any utterance in kind of public speech is impregnated then with all of the past moments in which it was ever uttered. 
And so I, I like that image a lot. And I think that, so these Song Yuan kind of ideas and practices are, this is where I get the imagery that's baked in to something like the banner, right? So that's, to me, that's an easier way to go. Now, if you're the opposite, like you, you're starting with Song sources or something, right? Then, okay, well, what does contemporary, what, what, does, what would something like today, how could it help? And I think what I found sort of reading now at this point, quite a lot of Song Yuan sort of Taoist material, Dao Pa Hui Yuan and so forth, is that having some exposure with contemporary ritual gives me a kind of feel, uh, it kind of improves my imagination for what could be going on, what could be described then in uh, a text from that period. And so it's a kind of cautious use of anachronism, for lack of a better word. But you have to be careful, right? Because it's really easy to sort of, you know, kind of go too far. And you have to build as much context as you possibly can, which all good historians do. But I, I find that, that it increases my sensitivity and, and it widens the kinds of questions that I would ask of the text. And, and it gives me, it gives a text a kind of vibrancy that I don't think I would normally have. Cause I think it's really, really, really hard to imagine what's going on that these texts are sort of scripting or talking about or alluding to. Um, I think it's, it's, it's just really, really hard. I mean, it, this culture is remote from us, all of us. So um, yeah, I think the same principle applies actually for say practice. I think, you know, people involved in ritual practice in their personal lives or with meditation, it's, it, it, it does tend to increase this, a similar kind of sensitivity then for reading older materials. But again, I think we have to be really judicious about it, you know, but, you know, all good historians are sort of super cautious people. <laughs> so that's sort of how I think about it. I mean, I'd love to hear, maybe not now, but at some point, what, what you, how you, how you go about things. Thanks. Thank you, David, and thank you, uh, Jason. Uh, now, actually, we have a, the last question coming from uh, Theo Stapleton, and uh, I will read it for him. So uh, thanks for the great talk. I would love to hear your talk a bit about your field work. How did you choose this site? How did you find out about this community? How long did you stay there? Aside from rituals, what else did you observe? I get this. This is the question about your ethnographic yeah. side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's a good question because you know, how does one get into a project like this? Uh, it's not typical, right? Uh, it's demanding. Um, the, the current academic system that we work in isn't necessarily um, built for it. Um, so, yeah, it just very quickly in a, in a nutshell, I mean, a lot of it's happenstance. So um, I was put in connection then uh, by John Lagerway, who is uh, you know, one of the foremost sort of scholars in, of, the, of, of Taoist ritual ever, really, um, with two French scholars who were working in Beijing, Alana Rowe and Patrice Hava, who had just begun starting to work in, in Hunan. And, and so I went to Beijing and I just hung around with them and they took me to Hunan as a kind of clueless graduate student uh, already many years ago. And I just kind of uh, learned slowly as I went. Uh, I struck out on my own after time and I found this corner of, um, of Hunan that people hadn't gone to, no one had studied uh, that I knew of. Um, and that was serendipitous too. Uh, uh, I, was, I just was put into contact by uh, a what was called a local scholar that Alana Rowe was organizing local scholars in Hunan, high school teachers, some, some Taoist and Buddhist practitioners to write about their own traditions or the, or the traditions they knew of. And he published it in a series, in an edited volume with Chen Zai of Beijing Shifan uh, Dajue. And, and so uh, he knew a lot of local scholars in Hunan. And so he put me in contact with one who knew of the lineage that I showed you today. And he took me to, they were doing a jiao actually. Uh, and then I just was hanging out and uh, these, some of the priests, uh, the, some of the masters of Chen Ding'an or uh, Chen Di Wen were more interested in me than I was in them. And so they really sort of welcomed me in a way that I did not initiate. So that was serendipitous. 
so a lot a lot of luck a lot has to go right and and but i think persistence helps i mean you know hunting around sort of as elena can probably tell you hunting around sort of the countryside of south china i mean if you're there if for not too long you're going to run into people who take an interest it's odd for people to take an interest in these things these are everyday occurrences people don't think about it that much it's odd that some foreigner would show up interested uh, and so if you get intellectually engaged Taoists, which I was lucky that this lineage had uh, a handful of, then, then it's very stimulating. And then you really, I, I ended up creating real relationships and friendships with these people and I still have them. Um, and so, so that's sort of what happened. How uh, uh, I, I went, I would go for months at a time whenever I could for, you know, over years, sometimes just a few days, sometimes a few weeks, sometimes several months and just spend as much time as I could learning the rhythms of these people's lives. Um, you know, what else did I observe? As we talked about before, I mean, there's a whole village world around this, right? Uh, there's so much to, to study and do. There's so much I haven't even scratched the surface of. Uh, you know, village life on the ground is rich. Religious life is rich. Um, so, you know, I observed a lot of rituals I filmed a lot. I, I have, you know, hundreds of manuals uh, from this lineage and, and some others, and I, I learned to read them with these Taoists while looking at the films that we just sort of saw together, uh, where they taught me how they learn, and so that's what I did. I hope that helps, uh, Theo. Theo, did you have a quick uh, follow-up on anything like that? Mm. No. I mean, just to to say thank you. I mean. I think it's a fascinating, fascinating methodology, and it seems to produce amazing results. And personally, um, I think the approach to narrative and and the importance you're placing on ethnography and tying that in with text is is really inspiring. So yeah, really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, let me know. I mean, if you're interested, if anyone's interested in actually getting into this kind of work, um, yeah, please let me know. I'll do my level best to help. And you will take them um, to the field, right? Okay. <laughs> so, John, uh, if you have students or, uh, you know, or, or anybody, you know, uh, you want to go, maybe just, uh, uh, you know, contact David. But uh, it's not it's not hard. I mean, it, you know, I mean, South China is teeming with religious life. I mean, if you just go to any sort of rural place and listen, you're going to hear some funeral or you know some ritual going on somewhere. You're going to hear the music. Follow your ears. You'll you'll find it. It's 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 everywhere. It's ubiquitous, uh, and yeah. So, uh, yes. Um, so, thank you very much. On that note, this is a very, very informative and productive and fruitful uh, conversation. So, thank you, David, for bringing this conversation to us, and and thank you all for attending. So, we hope to see you at another event in the in the uh, in that's hosted by the center. Uh, everybody have a good evening or good morning or good night. Thank you. <laughs>